Open our Bibles at this time to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 4, and verse 1. 1 Corinthians 4 1 will be on page 1215 if you're using the Pew Bible this morning. This morning being January 27th, 2019. Our text for the last time in this series will be in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 1. And the title for the last time in this series is What are the mysteries that we're supposed to be the stewards of? What are the mysteries we're supposed to be the stewards of? Part 6. And we begin with a story that took place in the dining car of a cross-country train. As the steward was bringing a passenger the steak dinner that he'd ordered, the passenger noticed that the steward had his thumb on his steak as he held the plate. And he said to him, What's the matter with you? What are you doing with your thumb on my steak? To which the steward replied, what? You'd rather it fell on the floor again? <laughs> well, speaking of stewards, if you've been with us for the past few Sundays, you know the Apostle Paul says that you and I are stewards of something he calls the mysteries of God. Right here in our text in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 1, where I direct your attention at this time. Paul says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of of the mysteries of God. Now in the past few weeks, we've considered six of the seven mysteries found in Paul's epistles. And the one we want to consider this morning to conclude this series is the one Paul mentions in your first cross-reference in Ephesians 1, Verses 9 and 10, where he talks about the mystery of his will, the dispensation of the fullness of times. Now, as you can see, the last mystery that we're supposed to be the stewards of is the mystery of his will. And, as you can also see, the mystery of his will has to do with something called the dispensation of the fullness of times. So, if we're going to learn what the mystery of his will is, we're going to have to begin by figuring out what the dispensation of the fullness of times is. Now, you all know what a dispensation is. 
we live in what Paul calls, in your next reference in Ephesians 3, 2, the dispensation of the grace of God. But there's coming a dispensation called the dispensation of the fullness of times. And the best way to figure out what the fullness of times is is to compare it to what we learned a few weeks ago about the fullness of the Gentiles and the fullness of Israel. Speaking of Israel, in your next reference in Romans 11.12, it says, If the fall of them, if the fall of Israel be the riches of the world, how much more their fullness. Well, as you can see, whatever Israel's fullness is, it must be the opposite of her fall, right? And Israel fell when she rejected the kingdom that the Lord came to offer them. So her fullness must come when she receives the kingdom that the Lord came to offer them. And when they do, they'll start being what it says in Revelation 5 and verse 10, kings and priests on the earth in their kingdom. And you know what? The fullness of the Gentiles, the fullness of us Gentiles, is pretty much the same thing. Our fullness is going to come when we get our kingdom. Remember what Paul said about our fullness in your next reference in Romans 11.25? He said, speaking of Israel, blindness is part, in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. We studied that and we saw that today in the dispensation of grace, Israel is in a state of blindness. But that's going to end when the Lord raptures us to heaven and we inherit our kingdom. You know, the one Paul talked about in your next reference in 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 52. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Once the Lord changes our bodies at the rapture, will be able to live in the kingdom of heaven in heaven where we'll do what Paul says in your next reference and judge angels as it says there in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 3. Now, did you notice that in both those cases the fullness of Israel and the fullness of the Gentiles has to do with kingdoms. Their fullness comes when they get their kingdom. Our fullness comes when we get our kingdom. That's why I think the dispensation of the fullness of times has to do with kingdoms as well. Especially when you consider the way Daniel uses that word, times. Look at your next reference in Daniel 2, verses 20 and 21. He says, God changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and he sets up kings. Now, when Daniel says, God changes the times and the seasons. And then he goes on to say that he removes kings and sets up kings. I think he's defining what he means when he says God changes the times and the seasons, right? I think the word times has to do with the removing and setting up of kings. And the season of time in which those kings 
reign. And you know what? If you know the book of Daniel, you know that that's what the book of Daniel is all about. Daniel predicted that the kingdom of Babylon would be removed and replaced by the kingdom of what? Anybody remember? The Medes and the Persians. And then the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians would be removed and be replaced by the kingdom of what? Anybody? Of Grisha. Eventually, Daniel talks about the Antichrist and how he's going to want to remove the kings of the earth and replace them with himself by making himself king of the earth. That's what it means when you read in Daniel 7 and verse 25 speaking of the Antichrist, he shall speak great words against the Most High and think to change times and laws. But if you know your Bible, you know God's not going to let that happen. God's not going to let him replace the kings of the earth with himself, making himself king of the earth. God plans to replace the kingdoms of men with the kingdom of heaven on earth. That's why after the Lord rose from the dead in your next reference, the twelve apostles asked Him in Acts 1, 6, and 7, Lord, wilt Thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? just like we had it under Solomon's reign, as they were th thinking about. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the kingdom. Is that what yours? No! He said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. Now, did you catch that? They asked about the kingdom, and he answered by talking about times and seasons. So that means the times and the seasons there must refer to when the Lord's going to remove the kings of the earth and replace them with Himself. And after that, He's going to reign on the earth for a season of a thousand years, right? Now, I know you followed all that. Let's apply all of that to the dispensation of the fullness of times. If the fullness of the Gentiles has to do with us getting our kingdom, and the fullness of Israel has to do with them getting their kingdom, and the word times has to do with the changing of kingdoms, then the dispensation of the fullness of times must have to do with a change that God plans to make in our kingdoms. Now don't get worried that the change He's planning to make involves letting you go. <laughs> Firing you, as the world puts letting you go. I mean, He's not planning on letting you judge angels for a while and then removing you and replacing you. And he's not going to replace the Jews in their kingdom either. No, the change that God plans to make in the dispensation of the fullness of times is one that Paul goes on to talk about in Ephesians 1 and verse 10. Your next reference. In the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Christ. Now the all things there, when it talks about all things in Christ, that's the saved of all ages. That's the Jews and us. We're the ones that are going to be in Christ in heaven. The Jews are the ones that are going to be in Christ on earth. And the change that God plans to make is gathering those two kingdoms into one kingdom in the dispensation of the fullness of times. You say, well, when will that be? 
Well, we already said the Jews are going to reign on the earth for a thousand years, right? Isn't that what it says in your next reference? In Revelation 20 and verse 4, they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. We call that the, the millennium or the, the millennial kingdom. And I know you know the word millennium because there's a lot of talk these days about what they call millennials, right? And uh, I just figured out what they mean by that word. Uh, I thought it meant people born in this millennium, you know, since the year 2000. Now, the other day, I heard about a millennial who was running for president in 2020. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. You got to be 35 to be president. And so, how's a guy who was born since the year 2000 running for president? Turns out, a millennial is someone who reached adulthood during this millennium. Did you know that? Your dumb, clueless pastor didn't know that. I, I had no idea. I finally looked it up and I said, All right, I'm talking about a millennium. Let's find out what, they, what these millennials are. Well, I know you know the word. And after the rapture and after the tribulation, the Jews with Christ will reign on the earth over the Gentiles for a thousand years in the millennial kingdom. And we know what happens after that because your next reference tells us in Revelation 20, verses 7 through 21 2. When the thousand years are expired... I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So obviously, after the millennial kingdom, New Jerusalem comes down from heaven to the earth. I don't know if you know it or not, but there is a, a city of Jerusalem in heaven just like the, there's one on the earth. One that you read about in your next reference in Hebrews 12 and verse 22 where it talks about the heavenly Jerusalem. And if you know your Bible, you know that what comes after that is nothing. <laughs> When New Jerusalem comes down, we call that the eternal state. Because as far as the Bible is concerned, nothing comes after the New Jerusalem comes down. And I personally believe that is where God plans to gather together all the things in Christ. And that that's where we're going to live together with the Jews... And really all the saints who lived before there were Jews, before there was an Israel, men like Adam and Abel and Noah, they're all part of God's earthly program. They're all part of those who will be in Christ on earth. Now, I have to pause to tell you that I'm about the only grace pastor I know that believes and teaches this. Although... It's possible that Pastor Stam might have believed that. And I say that because he believed what I do about what the Bible calls the Bride of Christ. We just saw that when New, New Jerusalem comes down, she'll be prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I think New Jerusalem is the Bride of Christ. I can't believe I forgot to give you the reference of Revelation 21, 9 and 10. Look it up when you get a chance. Revelation 21, 9 and 10 because John was told, Let me sh he says, I'll, I'll show you the, the, the bride and they showed him New Jerusalem. So, because of that, most grace teachers say the bride is Israel because of what you read in your next reference in Isaiah 54, verse 5, where God told the people of Israel, Thy maker is thy husband's. Thy husband, I should say. So, 
Most grace pastors say that only the Jews will live in New Jerusalem because only the Jews are part of the bride. But Pastor Stam and I believe the bride includes us. Because our apostle says things like Romans 7.4 Ye are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that ye should be married to another. To who? Even to him who is raised from the dead. Our apostle Paul, the apostle of grace, says that people who are dead to the law are married to Christ. Well, we're the ones who are dead to the law, aren't we? <laughs> and Paul says in your next reference in 1 Corinthians 11, 2, I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Another verse that seems to me it's saying that we're part of the bride of Christ. So, even though the bride of Christ started out having to do with Israel back there in Isaiah, God broadened it to include us Gentiles, just like He did with the death of Christ. Remember, Christ's death for our sins had to do with Israel, didn't it? And then God broadened it to include us Gentiles. You know the verses. The last one there in Matthew 20, 28, the Lord said that the Son of Man came to give His life a ransom for many, the many in Israel. But God broadened the sacrifice of Christ in 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6, <clears throat> when the Apostle Paul says, Christ Jesus gave himself a ransom for all. Now Paul also says in Ephesians 5, verses 31 and 32, another thing that makes you think you're part of the bride of Christ. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church, Paul goes on to say. Paul is saying the relationship between husband and wife is the same relationship between us and Christ. And that sounds like we're part of the bride of Christ to me. Now, I know that most grace teachers say that, well, we can't be Christ's bride because we're His body. But that's the point of the comparison Paul is making there with husbands and wives. The oneness that husbands and wives have is like the oneness we have with Christ. But if we are part of Christ's bride and the bride is New Jerusalem, well, it kind of follows that we're part of New Jerusalem, doesn't it? That's why Paul says in Galatians 4.26, Jerusalem which is above, the New Jerusalem, is free, which is the mother of us all. Now, I know when you think about Jerusalem, you think about Israel. <laughs> and you should. I mean, Jerusalem has been the headquarters of Israel throughout its history and, and will be in the kingdom as well. But that doesn't mean that New Jerusalem can't be about us as well. I mean, think about this. When you think about Abraham, you also think about Israel, don't you? I mean, you should. He's the father of the Jewish race. But that doesn't mean you can't think about us as well when you think about Abraham, because what does Paul say in Romans 4.16? Abraham is the father of us all. Now, most grace believers acknowledge the connection we have with the father of us all in Abraham. But for some reason, they have a problem with the mother of us all in New Jerusalem and the connection we have with New Jerusalem. It's kind of like what some very good teachers say about the New Covenant. 
They say that since it was made with Israel, that it can't have anything to do with us. And my problem with that is Paul quotes the New Covenant and then he says in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6 that God has made us able ministers of it. Well, you know what? New Jerusalem is just like the New Covenant. Both of them started out having to do with Israel, but God broadened them to include us. Just like He broadened the death of Christ and His sacrifice to include us. Do you know what God says about Jerusalem in your next reference in Psalm 132, 13 and 14? The Lord has chosen Zion. And that's the Bible name for Jerusalem. The Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired Jerusalem for His habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell. Well, I got a question for you. If the Lord's going to dwell in Jerusalem forever, and He tells you that after the rapture in your next reference, so shall we ever be with the Lord in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Well, I don't know how the Lord's going to keep that promise unless we're ever going to be with Him in New Jerusalem, right? Now, I know that the Jerusalem the Lord was talking about there in Psalm 132 that He would dwell in forever is going to be destroyed. Look what Peter says about that in your next reference in 2 Peter 3, 11-13. He says the, the earth is going to be burned up. So we look for a new earth with a new Jerusalem. The Jerusalem the Lord said He would dwell in forever is going to have to be replaced by new Jerusalem. But that's no problem for God to say that He's dwelling forever in Jerusalem. I mean, there are, there are Chicagoans who say that their family has lived in Chicago since 1850. Even though a good part of Chicago burned up in 1871 in the great Chicago fire, right? Yeah. But it's okay to say your family always lived in Chicago. And it's okay for God to say He'll always live in New Jerusalem. Even though a, a fire is going to destroy the old one there too. Yeah, and by the way, that is how the earth will be destroyed if you read that passage in 2 Peter 3 by fire. Now, when I teach all of this, people ask me, well, wait a minute, if we're going to live with the Jews in New Jerusalem, how are we going to judge angels in heaven while they're judging the Gentiles on earth? And the answer to that is found in John's description of New Jerusalem that you read in your next reference in Revelation 21.16. It says, The city lieth four square. It's kind of like, the, you ever see the on the map the city of Indianapolis? Got a expressway around it, and it looks like a square. Although I, I heard them call it the circle city the other day. Well, it's not much of a circle. It's more of a square. <laughs> well, New Jerusalem is four square. The length of it is as large as the breadth. 12,000 furlongs. Now, we don't, hit, we don't use furlongs, so I looked that up. It's, a furlong is 220 yards. So if you want to know how big New Jerusalem is, you do the math. Seriously, don't make me do math. I, 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 don't, <laughs> I don't want to do it. No, I'm just kidding. I did the math. Thanks to a calculator. <laughs> and 12,000 furlongs comes out to 1,500 miles wide and 1,500 miles long. That makes the city two and a quarter million square miles. Now you compare that to the city in the United States with the largest land area. Anybody know what that is? If Brother James Sermons were here, he'd tell you he lives in Jacksonville, Florida. Largest city in the United in the lower forty eight in the United States anyway. Do you know that? 
after I knew he lived in Florida, he told me one day, I asked, what city? He said, well, the biggest city in the country. I said, well, New York City's in Florida? I thought it was, you know, and he said, no, the largest land mass. Jacksonville has 875 square miles. New Jerusalem, two and a quarter million. But the most impressive thing about New Jerusalem isn't how long it is and it isn't how wide it is, it is how tall it is. Look at your next reference in Revelation 21.16. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. 1,500 miles tall is what the New Jerusalem will be. That would make the interior volume just over a trillion cubic miles. 1.125, that's one and an eighth trillion cubic miles of volume in the New Jerusalem. Now I know our government's budget is nearly four trillion, but listen, let me tell you, a trillion's a big number. <laughs> we throw around trillions of dollars, you know, like it was nothing. But they gave you a statistic on the internet. They said if, if you stacked $100 bills up till you got a trillion, you'd have a stack of $100 bills 631 miles high. That means it would interfere with the orbit of the International Space Station. <laughs> that's a trillion. Now imagine a city on Earth that's not just 631 miles high, it's more than double that at 1,500 miles high. That means it would jut out past Earth's atmosphere, which, by the way, tops out at 300 miles, out there past the first heaven, where the birds fly, into the second heaven of outer space. And that means that you and I, as members of the body of Christ, can judge angels from the top of New Jerusalem, while Israel judges the Gentiles from the base of New Jerusalem, and we can all have fellowship with one another in New Jerusalem in between. One of the things I'm often asked at Brain Bible Society is if we'll, if we'll be able to do that, if we'll be able to have fellowship with Jewish saints like Abraham and David, and, 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 and if we're in heaven judging angels, how are we going to do that if they're on earth judging the Gentiles? Well, if we all live in New Jerusalem, we can. Imagine how magical it would be to gaze at the stars with Abraham. You know, the guy that God told to number the stars if he could. Imagine how challenging it would be to work out with Samson. Yeah, you know, the guy that killed a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. Imagine how much fun it would be to trade fish stories with Jonah. I think he'd win, don't you? <laughs> well, you can imagine all of that all you want, but unless we're living in the same place, you won't be able to do any of those things, right? And that's not something that I think God would let happen. Uh, I mean, I don't think he'd encourage us to study his word and read all about Abraham and David and those guys and never get to hang out with them, never get to interact with them, never get to fellowship with them. Beloved, we're all part of what Paul calls in Ephesians 2.19 the household of God. And God is not in favor of households living apart. So... I don't think God would let his house be divided. I think we'll all be gathered together in New Jerusalem. Now, by the way, when I said New Jerusalem would have a volume of one and an eighth trillion cubic miles, a lot of teachers think it'll have a, a volume of over three trillion cubic miles because they think it'll be a cube. And the reason they think that is because 
Well, they say that the holiest place in Solomon's temple was a cube. And that's where God dwelt. But I personally think New Jerusalem is going to be in the shape of a mountain because of what you read in your last reference in Revelation 21, 9 and 10. One of the seven angels carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain <coughs> Excuse me, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now, you see what he's saying there? The angel carried him away to a mountain, but didn't end up showing him a mountain. <laughs> he showed him a very tall city instead. And how many times have I told you that mountains in Scripture are types of kingdoms? Many times in the Bible, God calls His kingdom His holy mountain. Do you ever wonder where the Egyptians got the idea to build pyramids? Listen, Satan has always been an imitator of God. And he inspired his followers and you know the ones in Egypt that worship the false gods to build not cubes <laughs> but mountains and mount, uh, pyramids because pyramids are in the shapes of mountains, right? Yep. Now here's something else that makes me think that we're going to live eternally in New Jerusalem. The Bible describes New Jerusalem in, in great detail in those chapters in Revelation 21 and 22. And if you and I aren't going to live there, then there is no description of where we're going to live. And that's an omission that I don't think God would make. God knows that people fear the unknown. And for unbelievers, that's fine. I don't care if, they, <laughs> if, they don't, uh, if they're afraid of what's coming after death because they don't know what's coming after death. But I don't think God would leave us wondering what eternity is going to be like for us. Especially after telling the Jews in great detail what New Jerusalem is going to be like if that's only for them. Now, I think that description is something you can look at and say, well, yeah, I'm going to live there too. And find out what streets of gold, can, how, could, how they can be transparent like we read in our scripture reading this morning. You know, there's also a, a practical application to knowing that we're going to be living in New Jerusalem a lot of grace believers won't sing the hymns that talk about walking on those streets of gold because they think that's Israel's hope and not ours. And uh, we sing one of those. Uh, when we all get to heaven, says, we shall tread the streets of gold. And if you don't think we're going to do that, I don't mind if you don't sing that part. That's okay. We're a grace church here and we're not going to crucify you or tar and feather you or treat you like a leper if you decide you don't want to sing about treading the streets of gold. But the bottom line is all of this was a mystery before Paul. It was always the will of God that we would be part of New Jerusalem, but it was the mystery of His will that we'd be part of New Jerusalem. And it's the last mystery that God wants us to be stewards of and not go down that same road as the Acts 28 brethren who don't think we have anything to do with Israel. No, we're all part of the household of God. On July 20th, 1969, President Nixon made a phone call to Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the moon. And he ended that call by telling them after congratulating them, he said, For one priceless moment in the whole history of man, all the people on this earth are truly one. One in their pride in what you have done. 
Now, I personally think that was probably wistful thinking on his part because I'm sure there's, there were people who hate America who did not feel at one with us that day. But we've seen today there's coming a day when all of God's people will be one. And not just for one priceless moment, we're going to be one in Christ and one with God and one with the saints of all ages and one for all eternity. And if that makes you happy, say amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word and how it dispels the fear of the unknown, it lifts back the curtain of that which we cannot see and lets us peek in the window of a city that you live in and that someday we will share with thee. We thank you for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that makes that possible, and we thank you in his name. Amen.